The Spanish Grand Prix is often associated with sleep. It seems to me that every time Formula 1 goes to the circuit to Catalonia, not a lot happens. It is the opinion of this talking thumb that the teams are now just too familiar with it. They've done so much testing at the circuit over the years, they know every inch of the place and have got so much data, they've got everything now before they get there. It's a test track they've decided to have a race on. Also, cars too big, etc. But Spain is a bit like the United States when it comes to hosting Grand Prix. There have been more circuits in Spain than you think hosting the Spanish and the European Grand Prix. And those tracks are the Circuit to Catalonia, Jarama, Monjuic, I think I've got that right because it's in Catalan, not Spanish, Jerez, Valencia and Pedralbes, the latter being a street circuit in Barcelona used in the 1950s. As was Monjuic as it so happens, a word that translates to Jewish mountain that was run on alternate years with Jarama. So Jarama would have the circuit in even numbered years and Monjuic in odd numbers years, similar to how the original agreement was between the Nürburgring and Hockenheim. Nürburgring on odd, Hockenheim in even. There was also an agreement in place for Jerez to have odd years and Barcelona even years starting in 2013, but that fell through because money, as it often is. Always is. So for the Spanish Grand Prix of 1975, the teams and drivers turned up to this hill in Barcelona to find that the circuit wasn't exactly up to snuff. Formula 1 had been making massive headway in terms of driver safety in the last 10 years or so, spearheaded by Jackie Stewart, but now Jackie was gone, and there were new drivers in the place of the pious Scott with the beady eyes. Lauda, Fittipaldi, Andretti, Watson, and so on. Monaco was a challenge. Monaco was an extra hot Nando's, but Monjuic was like those sauces towards the end of an episode of Hot Ones that students drink for a dare. It had sharp gradients, plunges, climbs, swoops, sweeps, and like Monaco, was situated in a pretty part of the world, surrounded by parks, Catalan architecture, and greenery. Long story short, the drivers and teams had turned up to do their track walks and check over the place to find that the armco erected around the sides of the track was not up to the standards they were expecting. The bolts were finger tight in some places and completely missing in others. It was an accident waiting to happen and something you'd expect from those dodgy builders you hear about on daytime TV. The Grand Prix Drivers Association had a quick conflab and refused to go out on track. And the reason wasn't just track not safe. This was 1975 and as Motorsport Magazine pointed out, there had been three driver related deaths as the result of crash barriers not being installed in a manner compatible with the cars. Francois Sever had been killed at Watkins Glen in 1973, a crash that made Stewart retire on the spot instead of competing at what would have been his last race. Peter Revson, heir to the Revlon Cosmetics fortune was killed at Kyle Army and Helmut Koenig had been decapitated by an Armco barrier also at the Glen. Two of those deaths in Koenig and Revson had occurred in the same year. Andretti's main concern about all of this was that under Spanish law, if a driver left the track and injured any spectators then the responsibility was on the driver. So if they had a Koenig or Revson or Sever incident where the driver survived and spectators were injured, then it would be the driver hauled in front of the courts and not the circuit owners or the race organisers. Which is similar to the laws in Italy that resulted in Adrian Newey, Frank Williams, Colin Chapman and Patrick Head all being under investigation for the deaths of Senna and Rint. The attitude? As it always was, if you don't like it, go and play snooker or a similar game. You're climbing a Swiss mountain, you're not going for a walk on the Lincolnshire Fens to paraphrase one journalist from the time. The FIA meanwhile was nowhere to be found, they'd done a runner and sponsors were starting to loosen their collars and sweating as well because they paid good money to have their names around the circuit and have the logos on the cars. They wanted the cars out there, but at the same time they were now thinking, ah, we're spending hundreds of thousands of pounds for these logos to be on the cars, but that suddenly becomes a bad look when the car is wrapped around a lamppost and the driver is burning to death. Fittipaldi said he wasn't going to race at all that weekend. He was out for good. The others said if things improve they consider it. This then put the race as a whole in jeopardy because the race organisers were demanding that the world champion be on the grid. The Guardia Seville were called in to be ready to impound the cars. There was a stadium in the middle of the circuit that they could just dump them in if they needed to. So on the Friday afternoon in Barcelona, silence. That was until a Cosworth DFV started up. Just a single Cosworth DFV in the back of a Lotus. And that got everybody's ears pricking up. That's X, isn't it? X wasn't a member of the GPDA. It was kind of a paradoxical thing really. I've mentioned several times that Ix at the start of his F1 career was quite against Stuart and quite the maverick. He was young, he was of that belief that he needed balls the size of space hoppers to do this driving thing, and then in 1969 decides to walk across the track at Le Mans while everybody else is running to their cars, in protest of the traditional Le Mans start that had 
now become dangerous. Now he's prepared to go out there and drive around a track that had barriers that fell over in a light breeze, and he even admitted that he was being selfish. He had a championship to win. The other drivers quickly followed him out on track. In Max Mosley's words, it was quite the Pavlovian reaction. Once practice ended, the mechanics of the teams went out to make sure that five miles of Armco were properly secured, doing the job that the circuit owners should have done. It took them all night, but it's documented that around 90% of it was complete, and that in the dangerous spots at least, it was fine. The drivers agreed that this was enough, and after a quick Saturday session to decide the grid, Sunday, they were ready to go. The two Ferraris of Lauda and Regazzoni got away well from the front of the grid and led the opening few hundred metres or so. But then it seemed like the drivers were out to show the Spanish organisers what they were dealing with. Brambilla hit Andretti. Andretti was then cannoned into Lauda, who then hit Regazzoni. Lauda was out immediately. Regazzoni got back to the pits, Andretti had buckled suspension and continued, and Brambilla also continued. Fittipaldi held true to his word of not racing, and after deliberately qualifying at the back of the grid, he did one slow lap and withdrew. His brother Wilson did the same on the next lap, as did Arturo Mazzario. On lap 4, the DFV and Schecter's Tyrrell gave up and dumped oil all over the track that caused Alan Jones and Mark Donoghue to crash, and then Hunt, who had been leading the race in his Hesketh, also crashed on this oil. The lead trio was now Andretti, Watson and Stommelen, but Watson then had to pit because of a vibration, and Andretti's suspension finally gave out, putting the German into the lead. The race continued with people dropping out until lap 24 when the final straw broke the camel's back. Stommelen was coming through a fast left-hander when the rear wing of his Embassy Hill car, Hill being Graham Hill, broke off, causing him to slam into the outside barrier. In a case of turbo irony and good fortune, it was the Hill mechanics who had fixed that barrier on the Friday night, and had they not done, it would have caused more carnage than it actually did. Stommelen's car would bounce off the arm car on one side, hit another barrier and fly over it into the crowd. The initial hit was away from anybody, but the second hit was near a spectator area, and four people were killed. A fireman called Joaquin Benetchez Morera, spectator Andres Ruiz Villanova, and two photographers, Morio de Roya and Antonio Font Bayari. Amazingly, Stommelen got away with a broken leg, two cracked ribs, and a broken wrist. I mean, it's better than the alternative. But the race continued for another four laps before it was finally halted, and half points were awarded for the first time in F1 history, the final half point being awarded to Lella Lombardi, to this day the only woman to score points in a Formula 1 Grand Prix. What should have been a groundbreaking and historical moment, overshadowed by a huge and tragic accident that... Well, they were warned. What followed was like a scene from Hades, said journalist Nigel Roebuck. Shocked people spilling all over the road, sirens screaming, the Guardia Civil of Franco Spain lashing out with their batons at anything that moved. So Franco was still alive at this point. Oh yeah, November of 1975 he died. Today I learned. It was also a defining moment for F1 politics, because now with the big money entering the sport in terms of sponsorship, it kind of meant the power was being stripped from the drivers. In the past, the likes of Brabham, Stewart, Hill, Clark and McLaren could have just said no, like they did with Spa and the Nürburgring in the late 60s and early 70s. The sponsors and the contracts were now dictating the state of play. While the response to Ix getting into his car had been quite Pavlovian, as already mentioned, a big part of it was the team owners grabbing their drivers by the scruff of the neck and forcing them into the cars. Because money talks. This time, the drivers lost. The power would then be in the hands of Bernie Eccleston and the Formula 1 Constructors Association. But this is not to say that boycotts and strikes were a thing of the past. They still happened. They just ended up going through a different channel, as it were. Mon Jewick never hosted a Formula 1 Grand Prix again. In 1992, it was redeveloped into the Enea Olympica where the Olympics were held, although it did host a revival event in 2007. In 1976, it returned to Harama and would stay there until 1981, and would then come back to the calendar in 1986 at Jerez, until 1991 when it found its new home at the circuit that we know the Spanish Grand Prix for today. But it wouldn't be the last time safety would dominate a weekend before a massive crash, because in 1976, the following year, louder of the Nürburgring. So then, a look at the carnage-filled Spanish Grand Prix of 1975. If you've learned something new here today, then like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more stuff like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on anything I do around here. Big thanks to the people of Patreon for the support. And if you want to help pay the bills around here, then there's a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and pieces. Well, a super thanks if you just want to buy me a steak bake. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.